It was a rough day for many parts of the market, and a lot of that was as a result of some of the news coming out that Janet Yellen is suggesting that we may need to raise interest rates in the future. Of course, uh, she is the Treasury Secretary these days, uh, so we'll see if Jerome Powell happens to agree with her. Uh, but the markets did react negatively to those comments and largely sold off, especially some of the high-tech areas and, and growthier areas of the market. Uh, the Dow Jones actually ended up finishing just a little bit above break even today, uh, but we did see about a 2% give back on the NASDAQ. So we'll take a look at all of that, see what it means for our posture. Then we'll get into our trade application example where I wanted to focus on an industrials company that's starting to break out to new highs. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by MarketScholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Z. It's May 4th, 2021. Uh, all of you Star Wars fans having a having a fun day with it, I suppose. May the 4th be with you. Uh, anyway, if you're new to this pr presentation, make sure you're following uh, our channel over on YouTube by clicking subscribe and then going down to our description area and signing up for our email distribution list. We're also heavy users of Twitter. I'd encourage you to follow me at Brandon Van Z if you're not doing so already. We really appreciate those of you that click like and retweet on these Market Outlook related tweets. And then last but not least, we have a presence over on Facebook as well. Feel free to join our group at that web address you see in the logo in front of you. All right, let's go ahead and jump into today's activity. And as you can see, I've got chart 4B pulled up here in front of us. This is our typical four grid where we can get a sense of, you know, what's been happening with the markets, if there's any sort of distinction between the four major US equity indices. And today is one of those uh, examples where there is a difference. I mentioned in the intro, the Dow actually finished higher today. Uh, not by much, but it was up by 0.06% at the end of the day. The other three indices did close lower, uh, although I must say uh, they closed well off of their lows. And so that is a promising sign. You'll notice here these long lower shadows, for instance, on the S&P 500 right here. Uh, when you see that long lower shadow, basically telling you that uh, there were buyers on an intraday basis that pushed the price up uh, as we got closer to the end of the day. So while we still finished lower by 0.67% on the S&P 500, uh, it's a lot better than the alternative, uh, which would have been if we closed at the lows of today's session, then all of a sudden we would have been threatening these prior support levels uh, from back here around uh, April 20th through 22nd. So that's a promising sign there. Now keep in mind, uh, this does kind of give us again that impression of either a hammer or a hanging man. And this one's a little bit more difficult because you could really make the case for each. You guys that listened to my presentation on Thursday will remember that I pointed out this specific candle down below on the NASDAQ composite and I said that one is a hanging man or at least that's how I would interpret it although we would need to wait until the next day to confirm it and indeed we were able to do that as we had a sell-off and of course we've had three straight down sessions since then so that was a pretty good precursor to a, uh, a, a little bit of a sell-off that we've had here in the NASDAQ composite this one is not quite as as clear-cut in my eyes because uh, as I mentioned on Thursday, you know, the, the hammer and the hanging man look very similar to one another. It's where they're positioned on the chart that makes the difference between which is which. And if you have this looking candle at a resistance area, like we saw back here, that's a hanging man. Uh, if you have this type of uh, looking candle at a support area, then that's a hammer. And uh, they have different expectations as far as where do we go from here, depending upon what you select. And in this case, it's a little bit more difficult for me because I can kind of make the case that this is a resistance area as we just kind of hit a all time high on the S&P 500 here about four days ago. Then again, I also recognize that we've been kind of trading sideways for about the last three weeks or so. And this level that we bounced off of this morning would have been a very nice support level as well. So it's kind of like the, the, the candle is taking shape right between resistance and support. So um, right now, I would say the path of least resistance continues to be to the upside for the S&P 500 because we do still have that green background color telling us that we have a strongly bullish intermediate posture according to the market forecast. It's at 92 right now. And remember, regardless of whether it's uh, falling or rising, as long as that green line's in the upper reversal zone, we consider that 
that strongly bullish. And we also have the support of the rising 30-day moving average. Price is still above a rising 30-day moving average. So in a case like this, I still would opt to be a little bit more bullish than bearish. Then again, um, that's why we look at these markets each and every day, right? We recognize that we're we're in the month of May now, and there'll be people talking about selling in May and go away and, and all this kind of stuff. And we, we, we all know that we've had a heck of a run in this bull market in the last several months. Uh, most of us understand where valuations are at, basically the second most expensive in the last, um, you know, let's call it 50 plus years uh, outside of the uh, dot-com bubble valuations. So there are certainly reasons why we could go down here, um, but there's also reasons that uh, we don't have to. In other words, we have a very accommodative Fed. Uh, we have a economy that is reopening, at least here in the United States, to kind of support some of these prices. And so it, we find ourselves in an interesting place. I was mentioning this in my dividend growth investing class today as well. You know, at that time, the market was really selling off. Uh, we were down well over 1% on the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ was down over 2% at the time. And our dividend growth investing class portfolio was actually up today. And uh, if you look at some of the higher quality dividend growth companies out there, they're actually handling this in stride. Um, you know, our portfolios are hitting all-time highs in those types of classes. On the other hand, those uh, types of portfolios that are kind of dedicated to the growth-oriented areas of the market, um, some of the SPACs and some of the new IPOs and, you know, the exciting kind of stuff that you don't know if it's going to change the world or whether it's going to be a fad, those are not the stocks that are of interest to the market right now. The market's hunkering down in the kind of old school, higher quality type of stuff. Also, we saw a nice boost out of some of the material stocks here today. I'm sure we'll get a chance to look at that when we review the sectors more specifically here in just a little bit. So, you know, at this moment in time, uh, I think um, the path of least resistance does continue to be to the upside, but uh, we do want to keep uh, our eyes on this uh, candle here and see if it does lead to some further downside action like we did see where it was a little bit more clean cut that that was a hanging man candle there on the NASDAQ on Thursday. Now, speaking of the NASDAQ, when I looked at these charts a little bit earlier in the day, the NASDAQ actually had a bearish posture on the intermediate line. And you can see how close it is right now. Notice the uh, label here says that the intermediate line on the NASDAQ is at 80.40 and falling. Now remember, the upper reversal zone on the market forecast technical indicator that we use as kind of our default uh, technical indicator on this presentation uh, has its upper reversal zone at 80 exactly. So 80.4 is about as close as you can get to it. In other words, when the NASDAQ was at the lows of the session, we actually did have a bearish posture uh, on the NASDAQ. But because it closed well off the lows of the session, as did the S&P 500, it kind of bailed out that uh, posture. Uh, and it pushed that green line back up into that upper reversal zone. Now remember, um, that could easily change as soon as tomorrow. If we have even a flat day tomorrow, I would anticipate that we will be going to a bearish posture on the NASDAQ. But I will say that from a technical analysis perspective, it is healthy to see us kind of um, not slice straight through this moving average. It's thinking about it, right? It's not just you know um, tossing it to the side. Uh, right now, market participants are grappling with where they want to send the NASDAQ right now. Yes, we've had three straight down sessions here, but the fact that we stabilized right at that 30-day moving average I think is somewhat useful. Um, you will notice that the moving average color changed. That does make the NASDAQ different than the S&P 500 whose moving average is still green. On the NASDAQ, that yellow moving average in this case means that price closed below a rising moving average. Now remember, if that moving average starts to fall and price is still below it, then it will change to uh, red. But at this moment in time, it's just a conflicting signal uh, and we'll see where it takes us. But um, you know, it's been a pretty ugly couple of days here for some of those high tech stocks. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later with, with some of the high tech or the uh, technology sector specifically. But I think on the whole, it could have been worse. Uh, and uh, I think those that are kind of more involved in this area of the market should be thankful that we didn't you know, crash straight through that moving average, at least at this point. Um, and then let's talk about the Russell 2000 briefly here as well. We do have new information to report. 
which is as of today, we've now gone to a bearish posture on the Russell 2000. Now that is considered a weakly bearish posture, not strongly bearish. Uh, remember when that intermediate line is falling between 80 and 50, we consider that weakly bearish. Once it starts falling below 50, then it will become a strongly bearish chart. And remember, I don't necessarily mind this. Uh, we have an open bearish trade on the small caps as we speak for this particular presentation. Uh, I will say it has not been going as well as I wanted it to because I put it on back here, uh, but uh, right now it is still not in the money. In other words, I think we did a we sold a, a bear call spread on it. And so uh, with this give back in the last you know three or four days here on the Russell 2000, uh, it kind of buys us a little bit of time with that particular trade. So if the if the Russell 2000 goes sideways or even starts drifting a little bit lower, doesn't bother me in the least. I still wonder about this potential reversal pattern that we're kind of looking at here. Uh, it's not a textbook uh, example. Uh, nonetheless, it gives you the impression of a bit of a head and shoulders pattern there. Um, you know, it is, for those of you that want to be bearish on the small caps, it's a positive sign that we went to a bearish posture here today. However, I will say the same thing that I mentioned about the NASDAQ, which is for those of you that want to be bullish on the small caps, um, you should be somewhat uh, relieved to know that you were able to you know, basically stabilize right at that 30 day moving average. And in fact, in this case, you closed a little bit above the moving average. And so in this case, the yellow moving average is a little bit different than the yellow moving average over here. In both cases, yellow means caution, right? Think of it like a, um, a traffic signal with green being good, uh, yellow being halt, and uh, red being stop kind of a, a mindset. So the charts on the top are green equals good. Uh, you're off to the races. Uh, we have a conflicting signal on both of the bottom charts. In the case of the NASDAQ, the moving average is rising, but price fell below it. In the case of the Russell 2000, the moving average is actually tilted lower, but price is above it. So, um, you know, we're waiting for further information, right? We're, we're observing the traffic around us and trying to determine which direction uh, these will be going. And we'll find out sooner rather than later, right? That's the, that's the nature of the beast when it comes to evaluating these markets every single day the way that we do in these videos here. So uh, anyway, interesting day in the market. I think the big takeaway here is the fact that we were able to close well off the lows on all four of these charts here today. So hopefully that bodes well uh, for those of you that are, are bullish in these markets, which we mostly are. You know, that, uh, that bearish trade that I did on the Russell 2000 was very much an exception to the rule. The vast majority of trades that we've placed have been bullish trades. So uh, we're, we're, we're weaving um, uh, through these markets uh, reasonably well here with what we've been doing in the presentations. Uh, let's go ahead and take a quick look at the three green arrow setup here. And this will be chart 4D. As we're looking at this, um, there are no charts with three green arrows left. We did have that with the Russell 2000, but as I mentioned on Thursday, I wouldn't put too much credence behind that three green arrow signal because the moving average itself was going lower. Normally, when you want to put a little bit of credence behind the three green arrow signal, you want that moving average to go higher because it's trying to give you an impression on whether these are good trend trading environments or not. When the moving average is going lower, it's basically telling you that they're probably not ideal trend trading environments in that case. So um, not a big surprise from my perspective, at least, uh, that uh, we no longer have three green arrows on the Russell uh, 2000. Uh, when it comes to the other charts, the only other thing of interest is the NASDAQ composite did move to a three red arrow signal here today with us closing just a hair below that 30 day moving average. We already had a red arrow on the MACD histogram and uh, we received a red arrow yesterday uh, on the stochastic. So loss of momentum, closing closer to the lows than the highs of recent ranges is what you know those two indicators are, are kind of telling us there. So NASDAQ composite is not a great place uh, to be looking for those trend trades at this moment in time. Let me go ahead and pop on over here to the internet briefly. I always like to get an opportunity to say thank you to those of you that help support uh, these 
presentations. Now, the last time I did the video, I only got 85 likes. That's a bit shy of the 100 that I'm striving for, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, I thought I gave you guys a pretty good trade idea there with a bullish trade on Amgen, which, by the way, has gone up three straight days since I gave you that uh, particular bullish trade idea on it. And I don't think there's probably a whole lot of stocks in your portfolio that have gone up for three straight days. So if you like these presentations, if you want me to spend time uh, looking for trade setups to deliver to you guys and you want to help support this project to ensure that it gets done every day as opposed to going to some other schedule where we just do it a couple times a week or maybe just once on the weekend we ask you one simple thing and we ask you every single time so i uh, hate to sound like a broken record but this is the reason if we don't bring it up then you guys you know fall off uh you know supporting the presentation so please 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 do your best to support the presentation we ask one simple thing out of you and it only takes five seconds even though you're getting three hours worth of uh our time uh when when we're doing these videos each day so all you have to do is click like for us there on twitter so thank you to all of you that do support us day in and day out lots of great folks there sedona dividend company jerome tom irene michael keith dale uh, valerie cynthia SW, Joe, Michael, and everybody else along the way there. You guys are awesome. I really appreciate that and hope the rest of you can join in on that activity. Uh, also, while we're over here on Twitter, I wanted to bring up a few of the things that I was I was tweeting about earlier today. wanted to mention um, the material sector. So I, I addressed that just briefly a moment ago, but to kind of clarify some of my thoughts here, you know, I was mentioning on Twitter that the material sector is up today as other stocks are getting crushed. Now, this was five hours ago, so this was earlier in the session. I said it's actually having... Uh, a real-time effect on the sector selector. Uh, for years, David uh, has been talking about the possibility of the bull market not ending until energy and materials are leading together for a while. So if you look at this, remember those of you that are premium members can access this on chart 1E in real time, but with today's big surge in some of those materials companies, they moved up to the number three rank. Now, energy has been at number one for the last week or so, and energy for a long period of time back here, kind of in the, in the early March to late March time period, was number one during that time period as well. But you'll notice this kind of gold line represents materials. Materials really wasn't leading with energy. Now, they weren't lagging. They were kind of just one of the middle categories there. So it has been interesting to note that um, energy and materials really haven't been like one, two knockout punch, you know, co-pilots in this bull market that we've had over the last year. We had a period of time, I think it was last fall, where materials were leading, but energy was at the dead bottom. It was dead last. Then we went into a period here earlier this year where energy was at the top, but materials were just kind of languishing in the middle. Now, all of a sudden, we're starting to see a little bit more of that possibility of both of them leading together. And remember, that generally kind of gives us the impression of an overheated economy, a blow off top type of a situation, somewhat similar to what we saw back in 08, 09. Um, we're not there yet, but we want to be on the lookout for these possibilities here. And with a lot of those materials areas, um, you know, whether it's iron ore or steel or uh, lumber, everybody's talking about lumber and wood these days. Um, those are all part of that materials group there. So be on the lookout for that possibility if those two areas lead for let's say several months in a row that might end up forcing the Fed's hand uh, and we might end up seeing raising interest rates um, kind of um, bury this market at some point in the future it's not something that we have to worry about immediately but just something to keep on your radar there um, other things I was tweeting about here today um, this kind of ties into the same conversation. Steel stocks remain strong. We just cel celebrated our double day in new core steel for the purchase we made last year in our dividend growth investing class. So congratulations to all of you who purchased new core steel alongside my class last year. Uh, we did hit our double day uh, just yesterday, as a matter of fact. It probably would have been a double uh, late last week if you include the four dividend payments we would have received along the way. Uh, but nonetheless, a great performer 
for our dividend portfolio there. Uh, this is a dividend aristocrat, and it, in fact, it's the only steel stock that is a dividend aristocrat, meaning that they've raised their dividends for more than 25 years in a row or more. Now, remember, in the dividend growth investing class, we buy stocks when they're out of favor. Um, we don't buy them when they're in favor. So this stock would no longer uh, meet our buy rules, but it continues to be a hold in our portfolio where we're absolutely tickled pink with the performance that we've had with new core steel. But if you have a different mindset, you're not a dividend growth investor per se, and you're more of a momentum oriented trader, keep your eye on the steel stocks. They have been absolutely red hot here recently, and this is not the only one. Uh, we've also talked about uh, steel dynamics here more recently in my top down trend trading class, and also POSCO, uh, a, a steel company out of uh, out of uh, Korea, uh, PKX is the ticker symbol on that, and Steel Dynamics is STLD. So those are a couple of the, the steel stocks that have been trending nicely here recently as well. So that plays into that theme I was mentioning before where materials are really picking up in a big way here uh, more recently. I was also tweeting about you know some of the dividend increases. For those of you that want to see all 73 dividend increases of companies that have raised their dividends for at least five years in a row or more. Uh, I did post that, uh, so feel free to check that out. There's too many to describe here. And uh, this graphic here on CNBC was just referring, I think, to the S&P 500. So remember, this other tweet that I have here that shows May 3rd will take you into that document that will show you all 73. Uh, including well-known stocks like Apple and Chevron and IBM and Johnson and Johnson and Kellogg and Nasdaq, you know, Paychex, Procter and Gamble, and so on and so forth. So make sure you're taking advantage of that. Um, and then I also stated in this tweet, first thing in the morning, one of these is not like the other. And what I was referencing is I took a screenshot of our traditional 12 grid this morning, and you'll notice technology was the only one on the board that was listed in pink there. So we had a heads up early on in the session that something was amiss with those high growth oriented areas. And um, we'll see if that's the case still in real time here after the market is now closed. But remember, sometimes when you you, you, you check in on these charts early in the session, you get a feel for what to expect for the rest of the day uh, there as well. So just be aware that's an area that is now falling out of favor there uh, when it comes to technology. And some of you might have noticed on this chart 1E that technology has fallen all the way down to the number eight slot uh, here on the sector selector. So it's considered one of the, one of the worst uh, sectors from a, uh, a strength perspective uh, right now. And remember, that is somewhat different than what we had experienced in 2020 when tech stocks were all the rage, especially all those that were dedicated kind of to the work from home and you know your Zoom videos and all those types of companies have really fallen out of favor here more recently. Let's get back on over to the Thinkorswim platform now. And let's do some 12 grid analysis, starting with chart 5A. And as we're looking at this here, uh, you can see there's a mix of green and red charts on the board, and that's fairly typical for this first set of 12 grids since they represent all different types of securities, whether it's bonds or currencies or commodities or what have you. Now, the green background colors will be the bullish uh, posture charts according to the market forecast technical indicator, and the red background color charts will be the bearish ones. And so as we're looking at this, there's always you know, interesting things that, that stand out here. Um, one thing that I've been keeping my eye on here more recently is what's going on with treasuries. You can see treasuries did have a pretty nice day today. Remember, we actually have a bullish trade on long-term US treasuries in this presentation. I think I, did a, uh, I sold a bull put spread um, here uh, more recently. And so uh, I don't mind this behavior that we see here out of long-term treasuries. Remember, my hope for that trade was not necessarily we're going to have some big surge higher in bonds, but rather I want to see how this plays out to see if it does end up kind of bouncing slightly higher to sideways in the next month or so now that you know we've kind of uh, change the shape of this chart. In other words, we were spending all this time below a falling moving average on TLT, and things did change over here in this area where we've now been spending the last month or so mostly above that moving average, and that moving average has now started to curl higher. Now remember, bonds and interest rates tend to work inversely to one another. So this chart in the lower right-hand corner here is kind of the, the mirror image opposite of that, where you see 
interest rates falling the last few days and struggling with that resistance area of the 30-day moving average, just like bonds are benefiting from the support area of the 30-day moving average over here. And so again, I don't, it doesn't bother me at all to see that since we have uh, a horse in the race, so to speak, you know, with the Kentucky Derby and uh, the, the Berkshire Hathaway event, which by the way, I, I tried to live tweet that entire four or five hour uh, process. So for those of you that missed the meeting over the weekend, check out my Twitter feed for some of my insights on that. But anyway, with the Kentucky Derby also uh, over the weekend, we have a horse in the race and our horse right now wants bonds to go up and interest rates to go down. And so far uh, that has been working out reasonably well here in the last three or four sessions. So we'll see where it takes us, but be aware that treasury yields ended at 1.59% on the 10-year treasury. Um, other charts of interest, the US dollar was up today about 0.45%. Remember, we've been watching that chart because of those oversold cluster signals that started appearing about a week ago. We've had a nice little reversion to the mean type of a rally here. Uh, we'll see where it takes us. Usually when I look at a chart like this, my assumption is that it starts stalling out just a little bit below that falling moving average. So we'll see if that takes place this time or not. Um, you know, we had kind of a mixed bag in terms of the commodities today. With the rising dollar, it's not a big surprise to see gold fall today, but gold does remain above a rising moving average. So I'm not particularly concerned about gold at this level, but we'll keep our eye on it. Oil was a standout today. Oil is starting to benefit from this idea of kind of a reflating economy uh, where a lot of those commodities are um, kind of going up in anticipation of possible inflation in the system. And so we do see oil all of a sudden right back up here at three month highs. So again, that helps support what I had mentioned before with energy stocks being at the top of the sector selector. It has not been the, the smoothest process to get there. It's been chop and slop, but on the whole markets when it comes to um, oil or oil stocks have been more bullish than bearish. Um, and then um, any other charts of interest, I would say that Bitcoin, of course, has been in the news uh, with Charlie Munger having some uh, rather unkind words for it. Surprise, surprise, 97-year-old man does not like cryptocurrency. I don't know how that's, uh, how that's news to anybody, but nonetheless, it's been making some waves. And so um, maybe a little bit of negativity finding its way into Bitcoin there as it finds itself on the underside of that falling moving average all of a sudden after having quite a nice rise for much of February and March up until this most recent kind of uh, chop sideways that we're experiencing here. Let's go ahead and take a look at our sectors now. And from a sector perspective, we're going to take a look at chart 5C. And as we look at this, it is still just the technology. So I, I mentioned before that I had taken the screenshot first thing in the morning. So now we can confirm after the market is closed that in real time, technology remains the only chart on the board that is in kind of that pink zone there. In other words, um, moderately bearish or weakly bearish for a posture perspective. You can see that we did close below that rising moving average. So, you know, um, in that case, the moving average turned to yellow right there. But um, it was nice to see technology close well off of its lows there. We do have a long lower shadow on XLK in that case. And then I also wanted to point out materials. What an epic day materials had, all things considered, right? The S&P 500 was down fairly significantly today. Materials were actually up over 1% and closed at their highs of the session. So that is a new all-time high there on materials where a lot of those steel stocks that I mentioned before or the uh, paper and packaging forestry companies with lumber doing so well. Um, you know, some of the iron ore companies like Cleveland Cliffs doing really well. Um, so anyway, keep your eye on materials. They seem to be firing in all cylinders right now. Uh, they were our leader today and technology and discretionary were our laggards. But for the most part, these charts are holding up pretty well, all things considered with the exception of technology. All right, let's get into our trade application example here for the day. 
And what I want to concentrate on is an industrial stock. And you can see that industrials, while they didn't have such an aggressive end to the day, they were up about a half a percent here today. They did close basically at the highs of their session and at a new all time high there. So wanted to focus on one area within industrials that had kind of been sitting out parts of the rally over the last year, but all of a sudden starting to come to life a little bit more. And before I show you the chart on it, I do want to pop back over here to the internet briefly and show you that over on our stock selector tool, I've, um, I've already highlighted it here so we can kind of see something that might be of interest to you guys, which is we've seen this nice transition for LHX. This is a defense contracting company, a military um, you know, contractor. So uh, you can see that back here at the beginning of this year on January 1st, it was ranked 878th out of 1,000 stocks that we rank under this method that we use here. And we stayed in the red for quite a long time up until right here, the first week of, um, of April, we transitioned from red to yellow. In other words, negative to neutral. We are seeing progress in how it is being ranked at this moment in time as we've moved forward here to the end of April. So we like to see those color transitions. It's giving us the sense that it's picking up in its relative strength along the way. Let me show you a chart on LHX now and you'll see why it looks somewhat appealing. You'll notice that LHX broke out in a very nice way today. It was up 2.2%. And you can see that this is actually its fourth straight up session. So when we do have a chart like that, it is possible that because it's been up four days in a row, it might need to come down tomorrow or the next day or something like that, right? Stocks don't go up every single day. But I think we can all look at this chart and agree that, that is a very good looking chart, uh, at least for technical purposes. Right? We have a stock that has been outperforming the S&P 500, which is dotted line you can see down below here. So when LHX's price is above that dotted line, it basically means this stock is outperforming the market. It's up about 20% over these last three months right here. Um, you can see that this stock had been in a significant uptrend. It slowed down a little bit, came right down to that rising moving average kissed it and bounced right up and off of it, just the way that we like to see it. Nice little um, launch pad off of that support area there. We've also gone through earnings already, um, so that's not something that could potentially wreck our trade. Um, so I like that aspect of it as well. And this blue background color will tell us that as of this exact moment in time, we now have a bullish near-term posture in addition to that green posture also supporting a strongly bullish candidate according to the market forecast. So the trade that I ended up doing on LHX, which is L3 Harris, remember a combination of two uh, military contractors that got together a few years ago. Anyway, uh, the bullish trade that I did was a long call vertical spread. And I think I did it for the month of June. Uh, and I believe the strikes I did were the, uh, the, the 210s and the 220s. Uh, at the time I did the trade, it was trading at around 215. So we usually uh, buy one strike that's in the money, sell one strike that's out of the money. So at the time, 215 would have been at the money. So I think I used the 210, 220s. Remember, I already did the trade uh, while the market was open. Those of you that are premium members of Market Scholars get the benefit of learning about those trades with the screenshots of um, all of the strike price prices and the prices paid and the executions and fills and all that kind of stuff by tuning into my Telegram channel, which is our alert system that we use for our premium members. So if you need specifics on that trade, uh, check out that Telegram app if you're a premium uh, member. But uh, that was the trade I did, which was a more directional trade. Remember, when we're doing a long call vertical as opposed to selling a bull put spread, we do need directionality. Remember, when we sell a bull put spread, we could really just have the stock go sideways and we be fine. When you do a long call vertical in the way that we typically do them, as I explained a moment ago, where we buy one in the money, sell one out of the money, that's a more directional bet. It's not the most wildly directional. If, if you really thought the stock was going to take off and not look back, you would just want to buy the call outright. Uh, in this case, we bought a call and then we sold another call against it to somewhat finance part of that trade. And so this is a moderately directional trade that we are taking in this case. And what we hope to have happen is for this stock to be trading above 220 um, during the June expiration period. Okay, so that's what I had for you here tonight. I hope you got benefit out of checking out this video, whether you enjoyed 
the analysis of the general markets, understanding some of the technical analysis behind some of the long lower shadows and where things stand with the various colors on our moving averages, or whether you enjoyed the uh, trade application example here. Remember, I ask one and only one thing out of you. Take five seconds out of your day to click like for us there on Twitter. That will help ensure that we can do these videos as often as possible going forward. So with that, I wanna wish you all the best of success with your trades and your investments. Goodbye for now.